Welcome to Break Forth Fully Alive. We are Elsa and Arlen Salty, your hosts and the directors and founders of Break Forth Ministries. We can all use a little inspiration in our day, and that's why Break Forth Fully Alive is here for you. After four decades of holding events throughout the world, we're pulling together some of the best of the best messages and classes from these events. But before we get into today's show, we want to invite you to head over to our website at breakforthministries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our events, and more. Now, let's get started. Erwin McManus has committed his life to the pursuit of God and speaking out on the future of the church and its people. He's an accomplished author, speaker, and filmmaker, as well as the founder and lead pastor of Mosaic in Los Angeles, a church whose campuses are attended by over 5,000 people every week. To learn more about Erwin, go to erwinmcmanus.com. Why is it that sometimes God's message seems distant, disconnected, irrelevant, or even distasteful? What does it mean to have an authentic relationship with God? Join Erwin as he discusses our relationship with our Creator and how sometimes our relationships with Him aren't authentic. Here is Erwin McManus. I, I'm kind of a, a socially um, introverted person. And a lot of people don't realize that because, you know, when you're public, people just assume that you're extremely public. And, and every time I'm on planes, people always want to talk. And, you know, I hear all, all kinds of people say, oh, no one's open to God. No one wants to talk about spiritual things. And I can't get people to shut up and <laughs> leave me alone on the plane. And so I went and bought these Bose headsets, which are a technological way of saying, leave me alone. And so I would put these things on, and so I bought some, but they don't always help because I was on an international flight, and this man, he tapped my buzz ear side ta, 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 to start a conversation with me. And, and I would answer him quickly and put it back on, and he'd tap a little later, and, and I'm going, what is wrong with this world? And and so I'm on the plane coming to Edmonton, and I have my Bose headsets on, but I have it plugged into my laptop, and I'm watching a movie. And, uh, and that's sort of a, a multiple approach of saying, I'm sort of in my own little world. But do you ever feel like God's speaking to you, and you but you're not really interested? Yeah, yeah, I know, God speak to me, but let's sometimes you're like, later, you, you know? And, and it was as if God was saying to me, talk to the man next to me. I didn't want to talk to the man next to me, because... Because I didn't, I didn't want it. I mean, there was no real good reason. I just didn't feel like it. I wanted to be alone and watch my movie, and I'm coming here to break forth, and I'm going to get to talk to thousands of people, so I can not talk to this one. And so the whole way, I kept hearing this little voice in my head, talk to the guy, talk to the guy, and I said, no, I don't want to. And, but you ever, you ever try to sneak in a meaningless act of obedience you know what I mean? You're not sincere, but you don't want God on your case. So you, you do something, you know. So as we started approaching, and the pilot said, we're approaching Edmonton, you know, please secure your seatbelts. I thought, okay, I'll talk to him now. <laughs> it's only about 10, 12 minutes before we land. And so I pulled off my headsets. And he's a very extrovert guy talking to people across the aisles and in front. And, and so we began talking, and he said uh, something, you know, and I don't even remember what it was because I wasn't listening yet. And, and I said, what do you do for a living? And he said, oh, I have a company. I said, oh, what's it called? And he said, it's called Awaken. Well, I have a company called Awaken. And that was very strange. And, and so then we started having this conversation. Or, um, and then I don't know how, but it quickly moved to God. I think because if you want someone to stop talking, God's supposed to be helpful. And, <laughs> but he's all interested in God. So here we have 12 minutes to landing, and he's all oh, so you're a spiritual person, and, well, no, tell me more, and I'm thinking, okay, I can get it all in in 12 minutes, and the pilot says, we, we, we can't get permission to land, <laughs> so we're going to have to circle the city for a little while, so we're circling for, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, I think, and so now this 10-minute conversation is now a 40-minute conversation, and it, it's almost as if God is a stand-up comic going, 
That's really good. Watch this. <laughs> and so now we're having a more deeply intense conversation because eventually you, you have to get to Jesus because you run out of material. That's you know, sort of elusive. And so now we're all the way to Jesus. He's still open and excited. And then the pilot says, we can't get clearance to land. We have to return to Seattle. And it was this God that was speaking into my brain saying, you know, I gave you the whole trip over here. But since you didn't want to have that conversation, I'll go ahead and give you the whole trip back. So the whole way back, he's engaging me in a conversation about God and Jesus and life and death. And, and we land in Seattle. and We have to spend a night there because I can't get back to L.A. because it's very, very late. And he said, we're, we're, what hotel are you going to stay at? And I'm like, which one are you staying at? And, and I'm at the other one. <laughs> and, and so he says, it doesn't matter. Whatever hotel you're staying at, I'll stay at that hotel. And so we're taking the shuttle to the hotel together. And he's like, man, I've never had anyone to talk to about God. And you know what? If you want, this is so fascinating to me. We don't even have to go to sleep. We can stay up all night and talk about this. And by now I'm going, I'm so sorry, Jesus. You know, I won't do this again. I'll be more sensitive. And, and I, I finally told him, I've got to get some sleep. I'm so tired. And he goes, okay, I'll meet you here at 6 for breakfast. <laughs> I'm not a morning person, but I show up and we talk more about Jesus. And, you know, he didn't open up his life and give it to Jesus or anything like that. But it certainly was an incredible journey together. And as I was lamenting not being with you, I felt as if Jesus was saying to me, because uh, you're only interested in speaking to the 7,000 and not to the one. Let's go ahead and skip the 7,000 and talk to the one. And it's, it's so easy to get lost in the malaise of our own Christian popularity and importance or self-importance. And so hard to just keep everything honest and true, authentic and raw, isn't it? You know, and, and we have a theme over these days of reaching out and connecting to people. And I just would really like to dispense the rumor that the 6.5 billion people on this planet are not searching and desperate and open to a conversation about a God who loves them and pursues them. Because there's a lot more going on out there than meets the eye. I think there was a time in my life where I actually thought that when I began talking to someone about God, that somehow I was beginning the conversation. Yeah. I talk about delusions of grandeur. I've come to realize over the years that God is fully engaged in the conversation with every single human being on this planet. And that he invites us into that conversation to join him. And we have the great privilege of being instruments of God to guide people into relationship to him, to bring clarity and beauty to his revelation of himself. And I've looked back and, and have wondered why is it that this beautiful, extraordinary message of Jesus, this historic human narrative of God creating us in his image and likeness, and God stepping into human history and taking on flesh and blood. Why does this message seem so distant and disconnected and irrelevant and even distasteful at times? And I, I know our default answer. Well, it's because human beings are sinful and rebellious and because we're disobedient to God. And there's, of course, truth in that. But there may be a deeper truth. That there's something inside of the human soul that knows the difference between what is real and what is false, what is authentic and what is inauthentic. And somewhere along the way, our narrative of what it means to be human and what it means to be connected to God has become inauthentic. 
You know, there's a lot of ways that you can trace human history. Some people study human history through, through art and music and dance. Uh, others study and track human history through, through wars and conquests and revolutions. You know, others record and study human history through nations and empires and kingdoms. But there's this beautiful narrative in the scriptures that, that gives us a different perspective of how we should understand time. Because I, I think what we need to do if we are sincere in our love for people and if we have a deep sense of desperation and urgency to see people connect to the God who loves them, we have to find a way to connect the human story back to that place where it can only be fully and beautifully and truly understood in Jesus Christ. See, Solomon, he also looked at human history and, and saw within it a conflict that can create an incredible sense of confusion. And he says this about humanity and our experience. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. You know this passage, but tonight I want you to think about it in a fresh way. He writes, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What does the worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on humanity. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of mankind, that they, but yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Did you hear his explanation of the human narrative? He has made everything beautiful in its time. But we, we can't make sense of this mess. Is it possible that that the, the best narrative to explain the human experience and our soul's longing for God is a, a conflict between tragedy and beauty. That God ushers in beauty and places us not only in the midst of beauty, but we ourselves, the reflections of beauty. And so there was man and woman and they were naked and unashamed and it was beautiful. And then, of course, we introduce tragedy to the story. We introduce shame and guilt. We introduce doubt and fear. We introduce violence and death. And so then all of human history becomes this tension between tragedy and beauty. And when we're in the midst of tragedy, we become most aware of our soul's longing for the beautiful. And at the same time, we can become most desperate and wonder if there is really anything beautiful in this world. I was sitting with an artist who had become a follower of Christ and he'd come out of the Gothic movement. And he said to me, you know, everybody who wants to hire me to use my art, they just want to use me for my art. They want me to sell out and, and, and commit myself to institutional messages that are superficial and meaningless like Happiness and joy and love. And in that moment, it struck me. And I said, has, has it ever occurred to you that, have you ever considered the possibility that love could be a true emotion? That joy could be a true human experience? And, and he looked at me with this blank stare. And he said, that thought has never occurred to me. And I think there are 
millions upon millions, if not billions of people on this planet to find themselves in a moment where they can even imagine the reality of love and of joy, of hope, of trust, of truth. And so I began asking myself, is there a narrative throughout the scriptures of beauty and tragedy and conflict with each other? And, and so I, I thought, because if this is true, then God is the ultimate source of all this beautiful. And all of creation is desperately trying to reflect his beauty, his glory. And, and so then when he walked among us, he, the beautiful one, would be virtually imperceivable to us because we've lost our sense of beauty. Is it possible to not recognize beauty when we see it? Yes, it is, isn't it? You know, I, I used to eat my, um, my meat. I love meat. I'm, I'm a carnivore. I, I know that's not appropriate to living in Los Angeles, but I can't help it. I have an ethical dilemma with being a vegetarian. I do. I don't think it's right to eat anything that cannot run for its life. <laughs> and those helpless fruit and vegetables trapped. <laughs> and, but when I used to eat my meat, I'd always eat it well done because I'm from El Salvador and in, and in impoverished countries, you, you burn everything to kill all the bacteria. And so you get used to carbon being a food group. And, and so I would always eat my meat well done. And then, of course, the title made sense, well done. Nobody wants their meat poorly done. And so I would order my meat well done. And I got a job in the steak restaurant when I was a kid in Miami, Florida. And when I ordered my first free steak, I, I wanted to work there just to eat free meat. And I ordered my steak, and I ordered it well done. And they wouldn't bring it to me well done. They, they said, the chef refuses to cook your steak well done. And I said, what? I said, is he not capable of cooking it well? I said, no, he's incapable of ruining the meat. And so I said, I want it well done. And we had this conversation through the waiter. And finally, the chef came out of the kitchen and came to find the man who would ruin his meat. And he said, who is it that wants the steak well done? And I said, me. And he goes, I will not give you my steak well done. I said, medium rare. I said, no, because I'm Latin. And he's Cuban, so I, it didn't work. And, <laughs> and he said, look, I'll make you two steaks. I'll, I'll make you one medium rare. And if you don't like it, I'll burn one for you. Uh, two steaks. <laughs> and so he brought me a steak medium rare, and it looked nasty. It was bleeding all over the potato. And, you know, I looked like it still had traces of memory, and I, <laughs> I didn't want to eat it. And, and he waited and watched me, and so I, cu I cut it, and it was, it was very odd because it was so easy to cut. It didn't resist in any way, and... <laughs> The steak had no character, and, and then I put it in my mouth, and it melted like butter. And I met God that day. And in a new way, I had never experienced life, and it was beautiful. But you know what happened? You see, I had trained myself to love carbon and didn't know what something at its elegant best tasted like. It's the same with coffee. I mean, I should drink swill. You know, my wife calls me a coffee snob, and you know, that's what all the peasants say, right? And, uh, my wife gets her coffee from McDonald's. I mean, I've tried, I've done everything I can, and, but she will not go into therapy. and and. And, you know, and so I, I like lattes and, you know, cappuccinos and Tim Hortons and, you know, and it's like, you know, it's got to. But the truth of the matter is when I first tasted a really great cappuccino, I hated it. Because it just, it was, you know, it's brutal. And I thought, oh, I can't drink that. And my friend who was guiding me on my spiritual journey said, you're just used to swill. 
It's going to take time. But you have to give it time. It's the way Jesus works. And, uh, and before I knew it, I had recovered from years of abuse. And, and, and then something exploded. See, the truth of the matter is that you can get so used to the common that you don't even recognize the beautiful. Who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There was no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Is that because when Jesus walked this earth, there was nothing beautiful about him? Or is it because we have so lost what it looks like to be truly, beautifully human that when he walked among us, we couldn't stand the beauty of his humanity? How is it that God could walk among us and we would despise him? Consider him unworthy of our worship. See, human history is a conflict between tragedy and beauty, and beauty walked among us, and he entered into our tragedy. And since we esteemed him not, we brutally killed him in our violence, all of our ugliness, all of our tragedy was focused on him and the brutality of what it has become to mean to be human was lashed out on him. And yet once again, beauty triumphs over tragedy. I think this is what John was trying to help us to see as he described the coming of Jesus. Let me just read this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it, because we had not seen life, and so it confused us. He was in the world, and though the world was made through Him, the world did not recognize Him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory. Now, just translate that to his beauty. We have seen his beauty, the beauty of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. God came and brought his beauty in the midst of our tragedy, and we were blind to it. So here's the question. If the beauty of God walking among us could elude us because we have lost sight of what is truly beautiful, is it possible that God is working in the midst of every human being's tragedy, but we need fresh eyes to see it? Is it possible that your role and my role in the human story is to step into the story of others who cannot find the beauty in their tragedy and begin to help them see how God makes all things beautiful in its time? The name of our community in Los Angeles is Mosaic. We chose the icon, the the metaphor, mosaic, because a mosaic is an art form of broken and fragmented pieces that are brought together by the hand of an artist to create something beautiful, especially when light strikes through it. 
And we wanted to say openly, we are a community of broken and fragmented people brought together by the masterful artistic hand of the creator of the universe to create something beautiful, especially when his light strikes through us. Solomon also says, just after he says he makes all things beautiful in its time, he says that God has set eternity in the hearts of humanity. And yet we cannot fathom what he's doing from beginning to end. And I began wondering over these years, is there something inside of us that we've neglected that would be humanity's best proof of God? Because if God has set eternity in our hearts and and just in a sense to retranslate what he's saying, he's saying God has put something inside of us that connects us beyond time and space. But we cannot comprehend it, so it's driving us mad. And I think for too long we have, we have been trying to convince people about the reality of God through processes that, well, can be effective and are helpful or are not the most significant in this particular conversation. It was just a few months ago I was in a, in a debate at Columbia University, and, and I, I thought I was going to debate one particular person and ended up debating a couple of other people. I thought the subjects would be one thing and ended up being something else. And it's always fun when you discover that. I had another experience there where I was supposed to go and debate a particular professor. And the night before, they said, we've changed our minds. You're going to debate a Buddhist monk. And my wife said, you'd better start studying. I said, honey, I'm going to debate a, a Buddhist monk. It's what he does as his life. I could study all night and on the entire flight, and I still won't know as much about Buddhism as he does. So I watched movies. <laughs> and so now I'm having this debate with a scientist from Columbia University and the professor from the Department of Humanities from Columbia University, and I'm sitting there, and the topic is what can be known? I'm an expert in ignorance, not knowledge. And so I'm sitting there, and the scientist says, well, what can be? And he has a, a written out statement as an opening statement. What can be known is what can be proven empirically. As a scientist, it's what can be proven in a laboratory that can be known. I thought, pretty good. And then the humanist said, what can be known is human action. And she was a a student or a disciple of Kant, and so she said, all that can be known is human ethics, human actions. But that's good too. And then when it got to me, I'm thinking, what can be known? And, and I realized that they had prepared statements, and I said, well, first thing that can be known is I should have written something down. Right? And, <laughs> but then I said, you know, I'm not really an expert in knowledge, and, and in fact, I agree with you. What can be known is what can be proven empirically, and what can be known is what can be seen evidentially through human action. And I would like to pretend that my conversation about God can go through either one of the paths that either of you have described, but while you can see it in each of those, that's not the honest path that I've taken. See, I cheated. So I have to confess up front, I know something I'm not supposed to know. I cheated. See, it, it's like Jesus. He had a conversation with a guy named Peter. And, and Jesus said, who, who do they say that I am? And Peter was complimenting Jesus. I mean, it was a contemporary, or it would be a contemporary version of, you're James Dean, you're Elvis, you're Marilyn Monroe, you're everything everyone ever wanted, Jesus. And Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Jesus says, and Peter says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then what does Jesus say? I mean, Peter, you know, everybody jokes about Peter and he messes it up all the time. Here he gets it right. I'm sure the other 11 were going, blasphemy! Peter's going to get it again. Man, he had to shut up. But Peter gets it right. This is his moment in the sun. Well, sort of literally. And, uh, and what does Jesus say? Peter, you're right. So you cheated. There's no way you could know this. That's what he said, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father, who's in heaven, my Father gave you the answer. So the only reason you got it right, because you're Peter. No. 
because you cheated. See, I had to tell them, look, I know something I'm not supposed to know. And I, I, I begin this entire debate naked, acknowledging that this goes beyond action, beyond reason. I've had an encounter with the creator of the universe, and his name is Jesus. So now let's work our way backwards from there. See, there are things that you know that are inside of you that you don't even know that you know. And there are things that people without God know, but they can't figure it out, and they need someone to help translate it and make sense of all the mess of their life. All of us have cravings that, that drive us and pull us forward every day of our life. And it's just like eating and drinking and breathing. I mean, you, you know you need something to drink when you're dehydrated and you become thirsty, and you're not sitting there cognitively going, oh, I'm thirsty. You just think, oh, man, I love a Coke or a Gatorade. You're not sitting there thinking, oh, you know, I'm a little low on potassium and iron, and oh, wow, my protein level is a little low right now. You're just going, man, I'd love to have a great steak, a really nice baked potato, some broccoli, right? Because that's, that's what you translate it. I'm hungry. You don't wake up in the morning, hit the alarm clock, go, okay, I got to brush my teeth. I got to take a shower. Oh, that's right. <gasps> I got to breathe. <gasps> I got to breathe. I always forget that one. That should be first on the list. So you breathe because you're designed to need to breathe. And there are things that our soul craves. And, and it's not that this, there's this irrational cognitive conversation you're in. Your soul is having a conversation. God has an eternity in our hearts. But we can't make sense of this mess. I always think it's interesting when people say, I, don't, I, don't, I can't put, trust anything I, I can't see. You ever hear that? I love that one. And, and I, I think I did this one at uh, NYU or uh, Columbia because I said, all right, how many, you know, say just you can't trust anything you, you do not see. All right, I want everyone to exhale. Now, I don't want, go ahead, exhale. Now, I don't want you to inhale until you're willing to trust something you cannot see. Because every time you inhale, you're trusting something you cannot see. Every time you exhale, you're believing there's going to be more. I mean, how do you know there's going to be any more? <laughs> I mean, take a deep breath because it could be the last one. You don't know. It's like Al Gore could be really, really right, and it, it could be worse than he's saying. And it's like, psst. I'm not taking any chances. You just have to. You just have to breathe. And hope that when you exhale, there's still life in hell. See, your soul craves. And what I found as I began diving into the scriptures and into the human experience is that every one of us, while we may have a thousand different answers to life's questions, isn't that the problem? Being in this pluralistic world that we're in, in this postmodern reality, there are, are thousands, if not millions, of different answers. You put 100 people in a room, you get 100 different views of truth, right? And here's the crazy thing. No matter how many answers there are in the world, no, no matter how many different philosophies and religions and theologies, and it, it doesn't even matter. You can have an endless number of answers, but you know what stays the same? The questions. See, somehow we're all united in the questions. Every human being longs for the same things. Inside of every human being, there's a craving for intimacy, a craving for meaning, a craving for destiny. It's been real exciting for me this past year. I uh, put these things into words on pages and wrote a book called Soul Cravings. And one of my friends here in Canada, Leonard Bueller, who leads Power to Change, which used to be Campus Crusade, they, they, they decided to take this on, and they bought 30,000 copies of Soul Cravings and handed out to every single freshman in the universities across Canada. And they were telling me, and I think these are accurate numbers, and in one place they handed out 1,200 books and simply just asked the question, uh, does your soul crave? Would you like to have a conversation about them? They said in one school, out of 1,200 books, 
900 students responded back saying they'd like to talk about the cravings in our soul. See, if we think human beings don't have, oh, you can applaud it, right? And, but here's the thing, guys. We've bought into a lie. We think people aren't craving the very things that only Jesus can meet in our souls. And in fact, it makes us really dysfunctional, doesn't it? I mean, all of us have this inherent, intrinsic need to make sense of life. We have a craving for meaning. And we are meaning machines. I mean, right now, you're listening to my voice. I'm just making sounds. And these sounds translate as meaning to you. Even if I speak really fast, you can still understand me, can't you? But if I shift over to you, I Anybody Korean? You see, if you're Korean, then those sounds make sense to you, but if, if you're not Korean, it's just gibberish. Pues hermanos y hermanos, ¿cómo están? Ay, que bien, ah. See, if you're Spanish, then that means something to you, but if you're not, it's just, just sounds. But you see, we are meaning machines, and, and there's some really hard languages in the world, like Chinese or Mandarin, Cantonese, English, very difficult. It is. Now I know what you're thinking. I was just a kid and I understood it. But <laughs> here's the crazy thing. You put a child in any place in the world and they have the natural human capacity to understand the language. And it's beyond words. I mean, there, there's this guy. His name was Morse and he, he realized, well, I could transmit, not sounds, I could transmit meaning through taps, and there are tribes that... I hope I didn't say anything profane. <laughs> Who communicate. Music transmits meaning, not just the lyrics, but the music itself. The beat of a drum. The sound of a violin, it evokes emotions, and it translates and speaks. Colors, we give colors meaning. Aromas have meaning. We are meaning machines, we humans. When you read, you're just reading little characters, little symbols, little triangles, squares, squiggly lines, circles. And we translate those into meaning. But the problem, of course, is that sometimes we don't know really what we should be getting meaning to because sometimes we make meaningless things meaningful. And sometimes we make meaningful things meaningless. Now, I, that was my dilemma, because see, when I was young, I ended up getting really confused about what was true. And my soul craved to know what was true, to know if anything could be trusted, if anyone could be trusted. And I was on this insatiable search for meaning. And my search for meaning put me in a psychiatric chair by the time I was 12 years old. Because I had to try to find some way to make sense of life. And so I found myself really struggling with obsessive compulsive disorder. I don't know if you know what OCD is, but it, it's a very difficult thing. And I, I don't have nearly the problem I used to have when I was younger. I'm almost entirely better most of the time. And especially when my wife says, stop it. And then I get better right away. But I would do the same thing over and over again and 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 over and over again until I felt like over and over again until it was right, you know? And, and, and when people are controlled by that, it's... it's, it's it's devastating. But what happens is we, we make something that's meaningless, meaningful. You know, like praying the same prayer over and over and over and over again. Right? And, and we end up doing things that are really not meaningful. And we give a meaning, but we make the meaningful things meaningless. Like making a lot of money and losing your wife. Being successful in your career and losing your children. How in the world can we get so confused about what's meaningful? In life. And, and all of us are in this quest for meaning, and every single person out there is trying to make sense of their life. And then when we are out there giving them answers to questions they're not asking, they go, oh, okay, whatever their story is, it doesn't match the craving and longing in my soul. And you get in the midst of someone's tragedy, and you start helping them find the beauty. And They'll listen to your story. All of us have a craving for destiny. We're, we're created for progress. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, the moment you, you stop believing that tomorrow can be better than today, that you can be better than you are, you move to despair. 
See, we're not only meaning machines created by God to live in meaning, to be rooted in truth and related to the one who is trustworthy. But we're also designed by God to lean forward into the future. Everyone here is a time traveler. I don't know if you know that. I've always been a huge fan of H.G. Wells. I love the whole, you know, idea of time travel. I've always wanted to be a time traveler and finally realized I was. I was just sort of limited. I can't travel backwards yet. And I, I can't leap forward into the future effectively. But I am traveling through time. Right now. Can you, can you feel it? The wind against my face. You see, every second you are passing into the future, leaving the present, looking back on the past. You are traveling through time right now. And you have chosen to waste your time listening to me this very moment. And no matter how badly you're going to want to later, you can't get this moment back. I know you're feeling very anxious right now. You know why? Because we are created by God to lean forward into the future. Because every human being, no matter who they are, what, what generation, you know, Gen X, Gen Y, me, Boomer, Buster, whatever it is, World War II, pre-World War II, and we're all the same in this. The moment you stop believing that the future has promise, you'll move to despair. Which is why God speaks so clearly in the scriptures. He says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans of welfare and not calamity, but a future and hope. And God is saying, lean forward into the future with me. Go there with me, because no matter how bad the present is, when you journey with me, there's always promise and hope. And so when people get around us and and our lives don't make sense because we're not being honest about who we are. They don't trust our narrative about what the meaning of life is. When, when they come to our churches and our churches seem to be trapped in the past, when we seem to be fixated in a time in history that will never be returned to us, they don't have a sense that you can help them discover their future. And every one of us have a, a craving, not only for, for meaning and not only for destiny, but all of us have a craving for intimacy. Every one of us have this longing and this yearning to find somebody, someone, who will love us. And we're so afraid of intimacy because intimacy requires disclosure. And we're not sure if people really see us for who we are, that they will love us still. And one of the beautiful things about our relationship with God is we can say, look, here's the beautiful thing about God. He knows you better than everyone and loves you more than them all. See, when when you're married, you know, that's the challenge, right? When you're dating, you, you don't tell someone on your first date all your flaws or you don't get a second date. I mean, effective dating is all about deception, right? I mean, you spend two hours trying to look like someone else. Right? You're the guy. You save up your money forever so she doesn't know you're broke. And, and then your first day, you do everything that you would not normally do. And you look for cues of what she wants you to do. And, and you don't go eat Italian. And, you, you know, and you just are very careful, which is why guys love going to movies. Because that way they don't have to talk. And if the movie is good, she thinks you're interesting. It really works out. And, and then you get married. And you know what happens? You feel like you have just gone through bait and switch. Right? Wait a minute. You weren't like this before we were married. <laughs> hey, you're a Christian. You're in. Right? <laughs> you know? And the truth of the matter is that marriages oftentimes fall apart because the process of disclosure is so devastating that oftentimes we hide ourselves for too long because we're afraid that if people know who we are, they won't love us. And oftentimes, we're right. 
And see, Jesus is the opposite of that. He sees right through us. There's nothing we have to hide from him. And his love is pure and true. What would happen if we began to step into this human narrative and help people find the evidence for God within them? Rather than trying to bring all this objective external proof of God, which can support your argument, but will never win the human heart. But you reach inside of their soul and you go, hey, am I wrong or is there a need for love, a longing for love, a search for meaning and for truth? Is there a fear that your life will never amount to anything, that you will die insignificant without hope? Oh, you know, I was invited to um, some friends of mine's house. And it was a very, great touchy moment for me because I guess I shouldn't tell you this, but there are a lot of, like, blogs and websites that don't like me and, and don't go to them and, uh, <laughs> and increase, you know, their hits or anything like that, if you would. But, man, and, and, and it's a really painful reality. And, and I got invited to go to this friend of mine home and she's a lesbian and she lives with her partner and through artificial insemination her partner had twins and I got to know them through the film industry and and I really love this person I mean, she's not a project or anything like that she's just somebody I really care about and she's interesting and and gracious and, and so she she emails me and says, Erwin, the babies have been born and they had all kinds of complications and our, our community just surrounded them and loved them and, and valued them as people. And in case you're confused, I, I'm not for same-sex marriages. And, but that, that's not what that particular conversation was about. And she emailed me and she, and she would come to Mosaic and, and I go, are you guys okay? And she brought her partner one time and I went out and said, did you survive this morning? And she goes, no, I'm okay. God didn't strike me dead, so I'll be all right. And then she goes, no, we listen to your podcast and we come. We know what we're getting when we come here. I mean, I did a 75-minute talk on sexual orientation. So it was pretty clear where I stood. But they asked me to come and officiate over their baby dedication at their house as they invited all their friends there, and I told my wife, Kim, I said, what do I do? I, I, I want to be in their story because I want these little children to know that somebody was there that day. I don't want the story of Jesus and the presence of Jesus to be an outside story for those kids. I want my friends to know I'm there for them. I said, honey, if I go, there's going to be another blog site and another website. And she goes, you have to go. This is what you do. And so I went, and it was on the Saturday between Good Friday and, Palms, and Easter Sunday. It was so cool. What a great metaphor. And I was nervous, and they were nervous. I arrived at the house with a couple of little Bibles and a little journal and a little uh, Jesus loves you, Lammy, you know. <laughs> and, and I got to the door, and she said, you know, her, her partner was very nervous. She said, how many times is Erwin going to mention Jesus today? And I said, only 50 or 60. And, uh, and, she, and I, I said, no, you know, I, I, I'm here at a, by your invitation. I would never dishonor you. She goes, no, we know. We trust you. That's why we wanted you here. You do whatever you want. And, and I said, you're nervous. What about me? I'm nervous. You know? and, and there were so many people there from the gay community and and it came time, and I just asked everyone to do a communal experience. I had everybody give one word of blessing to the little babies. And, and then I said many things, but I said this. Today is the Saturday between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. It's the day in between that Friday when God sacrificed himself and acted on behalf of humanity and the day that the Father raised Jesus from the dead and, made, and gave hope for all the world. It's the Saturday in between where no one could make sense of the tragedy and the beauty. I said, and I wonder how many of you are there in between God acting for you and your understanding what he has done. 
And it was the most beautiful, beautiful moment. They literally walked me around, introduced me to their friends that were open to spiritual conversations. And I've thought about this so many times. Why is it that we spend so much of our energy trying to make sure that the church approves of us? When Jesus was very unsuccessful in having the religion from which he came approve of him. And when, amen. And so I'll tell you one last story, I think. And so about a year and a half ago, around May 15th, was when, of 2006, was an epic shift in a friend of mine's life. I do a lot of radio and a little bit of TV, and I'm oftentimes on secular shows where they're trying to, you know, make Jesus look bad by making you look bad. And I always feel bad because I, I always kind of try to preface uh, my encounters by saying, look, even if I don't know how to answer the question, it's not a reflection on Jesus. It's just I'm dumb, you know. And, and I'm on this radio show or something with this Jewish New Age Buddhist <laughs> energy coach. And I'm asked to do this show on energy. I don't know a lot about energy, I, but I realized, well, you know, the Holy Spirit is dunamis, dynamite, Holy Spirit, power, energy. Okay, I'll do something, you know, and, and, and the host wasn't even supposed to be on the show. It was supposed to be someone else, and they're supposed to go to the audience for questions, and so I thought, okay, well, the, the host shows up, and he, and he interrupts about a minute in, and he says, all right, Erwin, I have some questions for you, and since it's his show, he just starts grilling me, and energy is okay, but halfway through, he goes, all right, Erwin, here's the one question my entire audience is wondering. What is the ultimate energy question? <laughs> he goes, all right, Erwin. Are only you Christians going to heaven and the rest of us going to hell? How is that an energy question? <laughs> I, I felt so set up by this guy who's now my friend. And I'm going to tell this story forever to shame him. <laughs> and... And so I, I said, well, well, John, before I answer that, I, I need to say something up, up front. And he goes, okay. And I, I said, my answer is going to be affected by the fact that I am a follower of Jesus Christ. And I believe Jesus is God, so my answer is obviously going to be shaped by that. And he goes, fair enough. I said, well, when Jesus walked this earth, it is said of him that Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to bring the world life. So if Jesus, who I understand to be God, who has every right and posture to condemn the world, if he refused to, then I'm not about to condemn you or the world. I'm just going to bring life. He goes, hmm. I like that answer. That's good. And it went real well. I thought, okay, I survived. That was really the goal. And uh, no shame, no shame. And, and, and then we start emailing each other and having conversations. And on that date, he sends me this email. To um, Erwin McManus from John Gordon. Subject, Erwin and energy. He is consistent. Hi, Erwin. It was great having you as a guest on our teleconference a few weeks ago. I wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart for helping me feel and understand the spirit of Jesus. Isn't that cool? You have brought him to life for me, and I am forever grateful to you. And he goes on and says nice things about me, and if you have time, I have time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll skip that part. He says, I, I grew up Jewish, followed the spiritual New Age path for a while, and thought that's where I was going. I never liked organized religion and never went to church, never felt at home there. When I became an author and speaker, I wanted to speak at all the spiritual non-Christian conferences. You didn't even know there were spiritual non-Christian conferences, did you? He doesn't even know that there are some Christian conferences that are not spiritual. It's an interesting world. And I wanted to speak at all the spiritual non-Christian conferences and was blocked every step of the way. My business partner, Daniel Decker, who you know, I didn't know him, but he thought all Christians knew each other. We're a very tight network. And... 
My business partner, Daniel Decker, who you know, started sending me scriptures and sharing websites and pastors like you with me. I would drive down the road and would look up at the right moment and see a sign that said, Jesus is the answer. Happened all the time. But I didn't like the church. I didn't like how they were so judgmental, unforgiving, hypocritical. I asked John, you said you never went to church, but you didn't like the church. And you knew so much about it. It was all through reputation. So I started questioning it all. I started to pray. I started listening to your podcast. By the way, we have a free podcast. If you want to go to mosaic.org, you can get every week's talks, video and audio. I started listening to your podcast. When I meditated, I would see a cross. A Jewish kid from Long Island, New York, was now seeing a cross. Go figure. I connected with Ken Blanchard, who had some thoughts for me, positive thinking magazine owned by Guidepost, made me their energy coach. You agreed to be on our teleseminars. All signs pointed to Jesus. And then it shifts. About two months ago, after a conversation with a Buddhist healer, and I went, oh, man, lost him. All right? Psst. So he goes, to, I'll tell you this, so he goes to this Buddhist healer, oh, I'll read this first. After two months ago, about two months ago, after a conversation with, with a Buddhist healer, not the usual way most people find Jesus. It all became clear to me. And recently, I have become a follower of Jesus. Isn't that awesome? You see... He goes to this Buddhist healer, and he says, I am really struggling because, you know, I, I, I keep, this guy talks to me about Jesus, and I keep seeing Jesus signs everywhere, and I feel like God's speaking to me, and I'm not sure what to do. And the Buddhist healer said, John, it's like this. See, Christianity is like cheating. He says, as a Buddhist, you have to work and work and work and work toward enlightenment. But you see, Jesus is like cheating. You give your life to Jesus, he takes you right to enlightenment. <laughs> said, so John, I think you ought to just go ahead and give your life to Jesus. Because that's what Buddhist healers do. And that's the application. On your staff, all of us should have one Buddhist healer. To help people come to know Jesus. He says this, people think that only Christians can point you in the right direction. But for me, it was the fact that God used everyone in my life to show me the way. He brought me to Daniel. He brought me to you. He brought me to the Buddhist healer. He brought me to Jesus. And now he will bring me to those who need to hear my story. I was recently on CNN, and you can watch me here. Thank you so much. I'm sending positive energy your way, John. And you can clap. That's worth clapping. Now, guys, here's the tragedy in the beauty. I finally meet John. It's as if we've been lifelong friends. Then he comes out to L.A. on a book tour. He comes to my home. He drives with us to the mountains to go to his first Christian men's retreat, advanced kind of experience. I have him share his story. Never done that before. And then the next morning, I took him with me to our Beverly Hills gathering in Los Angeles, and I had him share his story again. And when he was done, I got up and I said, hey, guys, I want you to know something about John. This was my community, Mosaic, so I wanted him to know. See, a funny thing happened with John. When John asked Jesus to change his life and he became a follower of Jesus, John was so excited that he wanted to do me a favor. So he started advertising my books on his website and putting our podcast on his website. And he started letting know, everybody know about Mosaic. And so all of these Christian blogs and websites went out around the country saying that Irwin was now a Buddhist New Age heretic. <laughs> it's true. And he looked at me and goes, oh, I was hoping you didn't see all those. Like, John, I saw them all. He goes, oh, I'm so sorry, man. I didn't know that was going to happen. I didn't know how the Christian community would react. I was just so excited about finding Jesus. I wanted to tell everyone who was listening to me what I found. I said, John, I want you to know I am honored to be a heretic on your behalf. 
And if we could do it all over again and have all of Christianity slander and despise us because you have come to Jesus, we would do it a thousand times over again. And guys, and you know, when Jesus walked this earth, he had a real dilemma. He kept getting accused of being the friend of sinners. Levi found him and followed him. He invites Jesus to a party with all of his broken, damaged friends. You can talk about reaching out and evangelism and you can go through all kinds of seminars and training, but in the end, we're our worst enemies. We need to stop trying to build a reputation in this small, narrow kingdom that we call Christianity. It was Paul who said, I would be accursed and sent into hell if only Israel could be saved. What would happen if all of us came to the place in our life where we said, Jesus, I would give it all up just to see someone I love come to know you. So I had this young man, this young actor come up to me. He said, Erwin, I, I've been a Christian all my life. And I just keep struggling with the assurance of my salvation. I just don't know if I'm really a Christian. I keep going in and out. And I, I, I said, well, you're worried that you're going to go to hell? And he goes, yes. I said, who cares? Just accept you're going to hell. <laughs> I said, just look, since you can't get it fixed in your head, in your heart, just accept you're going to hell. You can't do anything about it. And so you're going to go help everyone who has a chance to change their course, meet God, and be spared from the damnation that you're destined for. And then when you're dead and God sends you to hell because you were right in your worst moments, you can say, at least I went there alone. And a lot of people found Jesus. Because in a strange way, that's what Paul said. I would accept hell for eternity for the other. See, people without God, their soul craves. They have cravings, desperations, longings. And maybe it's time that we had a longing and urgency and a brokenness for them. Hey, God bless you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Break Forth Fully Alive podcast. We pray you were richly blessed. But before we leave you, we want to remind you again to head over to our website at breakforthministries.com where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our online and in-person events, and more. Until next time, may you become fully alive in the love of God.